my, but my hardest case was this guy Lipka that I started talking about. Yep. And the reason is the hardest, uh, I think I mentioned in my book or in my, the, the article there, that working with him, it was like pulling teeth, you know. He, he was very reluctant to come out and say things and all that. And quite often when he would say, for example, he was so, so careful that uh, even after 30 years, he was so careful that if you wanted to say yes, I had to ask him a question. If you wanted to say yes, he'd just go. You wouldn't say anything out loud. You wouldn't say that out loud, just shake his head. Well, I was recording everything, what was going on between us, without him, of course, knowing about it, you know. I didn't say, hey, look, I'm recording you, you know. <laughs> anyway, so, so, but I wanted that on tape, because how did they know what he answered? So I said, oh, you mean you said yes? See, when he went like that, I said, oh, you mean you said yes? Yeah. See, so I had it recorded. Mm. And sometimes if he said no, it'd go like that. I'd say, oh, you mean no? Because, again, I wanted it on tape. Because all that was evidence, ev eventually be evidence in in a trial if it went that way, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so but he was very very difficult, and sometimes uh, it go like that, you know. Uh, a, a couple times, uh, one time he answered my question by writing letters on the. For example, I asked him when he was at NSA, National Security Agency. I said, "We're curious to find out." How were you able to get secret material out of the NSA because they're very strict there without being caught? And he wrote on the dashboard of, the, of his vehicle, I got into his vehicle, and you know, sometimes there's a little dust of, dust of film, uh, a film of dust in there. Right. And he wrote H A T. I said, Oh, hat. <laughs> see, because I wanted it in the tape, you know. Yeah. He said, Yes. So, and then he erased it, see, see, that's how careful he was. But he didn't know that I was recording it when I said hat, you know. But that's how, so he used to fold the paper, put it in his hat, wear it, and come out, and the guards never search his hat, you know. Mm. Uh, so things like that. So it was very, very difficult. So after the, uh, well, if you want me to digress a little bit on that uh, case, on but, but that's, that's my most difficult case that I consider, you know, because I had to resurrect it. Why, after so many years, we do want to contact him, you know. So I had to give him good, come up with good plausible reasons why we want to talk to him and why he should talk with us, you know. Anyway, so uh, one thing after, after, during the first meeting, when he came, I called him on the phone and all that. He, he came to meet me at the hotel, at, at the motel. And I always told him that I'll meet you in front of the motel. I never told him that I have a room, come up to my room. Because many times, if somebody invited, told you to come to my room, it was a, a lot of people would be reluctant to go. You know, I, I don't know this guy. Somebody called me. Why would I go to his room? Uh, maybe I'll be attacked or mugged or whatever. Mm -hmm. you know? So, but I used to tell them all this. I'll meet you in front of the hotel or the motel door in the front, in front of the lobby. Well, it's it's in the public open space, so people don't be worried. They'll come and meet you. If they don't like it, they can get in the car and go. It's neutral, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an open space. So I would always tell them how tall I am, you know, give my description. I used to say I'm about six feet tall, feet, not feet, you know, <laughs> feet to, to make a little, uh, uh, what uh, the guy wrote an article about, he said, oh, Dimitri is good, use it at malapropism. Yeah, you know. malapropism. Yeah, malapropism. And, and so I would say feet, Six feet, you know, and things like that. So I tell them I'm about six feet tall, uh, extremely good looking. No, but uh, wearing, <laughs> let's say, let's say a brown suit and uh, brown tie or a dark suit and whatever. Yep. And I'd be holding a Time magazine in my hand. So they'll recognize me when they see me. They won't stop talking to somebody else who's there <laughs> instead yep. of to the right person. So, and then I'd ask them, what, what do you look like? Uh, what, what are you wearing? Well, anyway, so he came, this guy, Lipka, came. He drove a van, so he came over, and he drove by, and uh, he drove around, and then he pulled away a little bit away from the, uh, it was in the parking lot, but away from the entrance to the motel, and he stopped there. So I, I told him, come over, and he said to me, you know, so, so I walked over to see what what it's all about, you know, uh, so I walked over and said, uh, come over, I. I took, I was liberty of taking a room, you know, I rented the room. I told them that I just arrived, so nobody knew who I was or they could not put anything in there, you know, so it would be safe, you know. He said, no, 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 get in my vehicle. Normally, I never went into anybody else's vehicle. Uh, I never did, but this time, it, it was a matter of, 
if I don't get in, he'll just drive away and uh, we lose the whole case, you know. Right. So I got into the vehicle. I figured I can take care of myself if something happens. He was a big, heavy set guy, you know. Uh, he was, they estimated the article that he was like 300 pounds or something like that. I mean, he, was, he loved to eat the wrong things, of course, and, uh, and he sat a lot, you know. So anyway, uh, so I got in and we talked and uh, he drove away and we had surveillance around. And they, they, of course, I had no radio communication with anybody, but uh, the surveillance said, hey, the, the guy's driving away with Dimitri. Dimitri got in the vehicle and now they're driving away, you know. So, of course, they uh, kept an eye on me and some, some of the surveillance people followed us, but at a very good distance, just to make sure that is the guy going to attack me, is going to take me to West Virginia or somewhere else, you know, who knows, you know, you know, I mean, I'm in his vehicle, you know. Yeah. And he's behind the wheel, but of course they knew I could take care of myself, but still they wanted to know, to know where we went. So he drove around for a while and we talked, of course, and then he made, a, he slowly started to make little admissions that he worked for the other side, you know. And he said that he, uh, sometimes he used to meet his handler, sort of, in New York City. So he used to drive from Washington DC to New York City and we used to meet in a park and play chess. See, in a park. You know, some parks have tables with chess. With the chess, chess board. Yeah, yeah. So I said, oh, you play chess? And he looked at me and said, you did not know? I mean, he, I, I noticed that there was a big difference in him. It, it bothered him, like, how dare I not know that he played chess? I said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know. It's probably in our files, you know. Anyway, so when we came back, after a while, we talked for a while and all that, and finally drove back to the... Uh, hotel, uh, the motel parking lot, he stopped and we were wrapping it up. And he said to me, uh, he wrote, uh, I had a, a magazine with me, he wrote on it, uh, the letter, big letter R, like Robert R, mm -hmm. and then three dashes. And he said, complete that for me. I said, what is it? He said, complete that for me. If you don't complete it for me, I'll never talk to you again. He said, that's my, what he called it, my code word. Uh, well, I said, uh, I don't know what it is. You know, he said, well, if you don't complete it, I'll never talk to you again. I said, well, we, we have that, but it's, it's in our files in Moscow, you know, in our headquarters. I, we don't, I, I'm from Washington, I'm from Washington, you know. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we don't have it here, you know. I, he said, well, if you don't complete it next time, I'll never talk to you again. So... We're in a dilemma. So I said, okay, well, I'll see what I can do. So we said goodbye, goodbye, and left. Came to my hotel, motel, and he left. And surveillance said that he went home already. And all. So we had, uh, of course, we had three rooms there. One where I was going to meet him, and one where the other two were the agents were with the equipment and all the recording devices and all that, the cameras, and listening devices and all. So I, I came there, and then uh, after what we used to do after every case, of course, before I went to meet the subject, always would have a last minute, what I call powwow, you know, meet together and, and discuss things and last minute things, you know, uh, before I finally went to meet the guy. You know. So we talked about that, and usually we'd have a cup of coffee and uh, talk about it and kick things around. There were about, uh, we had, uh, we had the case agent uh, from uh, Philadelphia Division, myself, and another another case, uh, agent who was detailed to work at NSA, National Security Agency, and we had one of the NSA guys with us also, one of their security guys. But of course, it was strictly our case, you know. So we're kicking things around, and then we came to the, the idea of uh, the, the word that uh, uh, R, the three dashes, what, what can it be, you know, I mean? We have no way of getting it. It's, uh, I'm sure it was in the files in Moscow, but then we, can, we don't have access to those files. You know? yeah. uh, maybe Al did, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> we never did the rest of it. So finally, be, uh, and uh, I'm a chess player also. So finally, when, uh, when it came to that word, and we kicked in, what could it be? I, th I thought, uh, I said, you know, it, it was so significant to me how he reacted when I said, you play chess? I said, you did not know. So I knew it was very, very important for him. Big thing for him. So I said, because we talked about chess before, and I'm chess player, I wonder if the, this word is rook. It's R, 
Oh, okay. So we didn't know if it's R and three letters or three words or three sentences. Or we didn't had no idea. So I said maybe it's R uh, Rook R O O K. You know that would be four, and that fits in with this chess playing. You know, mm-hmm. we thought that. Then the case agent, who was a very very good agent, he did a great job. He wrote a book also. Uh, uh, f- so. He said, when he was studying the case, when he got the case assigned to him, which was, like I said, an old dog, an old, old case, you know, he did a lot of work. And years before that, there was a couple, an eld- older couple, came from Germany, a husband and wife, came to the United States as tourists. They came to the Lancaster area, and, and we suspected that they were working for some intelligence service, you know, but we didn't know for whom. And they're dri- driving around, driving around that area there, went to a park and all that. And uh, we found out from them, uh, from one of the things that they had, was they had a map of that area. And there's a park there, also on the map, you know, in the Lancaster area. And then the case agent, uh, the case agent had like three big boxes of files about that, because we had a lot of surveillance on those guys. And he said in one, in the bottom of that map, there was a, a word R. O, E, double letter, the umlaut, uh, K, you know, Rick, German Rick, you know. We didn't know, didn't know what it was. But I said, oh, maybe that's Rock, maybe, you know, it's probably Rock what I thought about, you know. But this must be German. So maybe that was his code. So I said, I'll, I'll tell you what, next time when we meet, we don't know what it is, but I'm going to mention the word Rook. If it is the right thing, we got him. If it is the wrong thing, there's nothing we can do about it, you know. I'll, you, try to, I'll try to, excuse me, I'll try to wing it, but yeah, go ahead. Were you afraid that if you said, if you said Rook and it was wrong, were you afraid of what Robert Lipka would do? No, I wasn't afraid. I wasn't afraid. I just knew he'll bro- break off the meeting and drive away. You know? Okay. Yeah. No, I wasn't afraid of anything. The only thing that was, uh, concerned me was that he might break off the meeting and leave, and we'll never have a chance to talk with him again. Mm-hmm. He refused to talk to me. You know? So the next time when he came, the, which was the next day, I called him again, made an appointment. He came, drove around, checked it. He drove around the whole, the surveillance told us that he drove around the whole, there was a huge parking uh, lot, and he drove all the around. And I think he was checking license plates to see if there are any Washington DC plates or something like that, you know, something you might recognize or some wreck car or something like that. He didn't find anything, you know, un- unusual. So he, again, he parked away and I went to, to meet him and I said, uh, I said, I got into this vehicle this time, uh, again, willingly. And I said, uh, I got in and said, hello, hello. And then I said, does Rook mean anything to you? And he went like this, oh, I thought you'd never say that. And I knew I got him. And surveillance, we had surveillance from far away because it was big open, but they had big telephoto lenses. Mm -hmm. And they could notice that he went like that. They noticed something unusual that, of course, they could not hear what what was going on. Uh, There was no radio communication or anything. So so he went like that. And I knew that I got him. So I stuck my hand quickly. I said, and we shook hands, you know. I knew that we're, that's it, we're going to work together. Yeah. So, so, so Rook turned out to be the right thing, you know. Wow. Uh, uh, and uh, the case agent did a very, very nice book uh, after everything was finished, you know. Uh, case agent was uh, John, uh, he wrote a book, and uh, the name of the book was uh, 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 Fool's Mate. Fool's Mate. Any of you who play chess, you know, there's a very important, very important, very well known. Uh, it's, a, it's a guy, one guy makes two moves, one guy makes one move, and the second move is checkmate. I mean, it's the shortest, shortest possible game that you can have. And it's called fool's mate because uh, the one who starts makes a fool, foolish mistake, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's fool's mate. So they, that's what he wrote, uh, the title of the like book, that. Fool's Mate. It's a very good, I highly recommend it to all of you to read it. It goes right from the beginning, uh, from uh, seeds to nuts or whatever you call it, whatever nuts you want to talk about. But anyway, uh, and of course, my part is very big in it and uh, how they uh, got me into into the case and all that, you know. Uh, anyway, so, so I got him and we took it from there. And then I met with him 
maybe a dozen times or more and uh, over the years and, and then it started to correspond also we gave a, a, a safe box uh, you know deposit mail deposit box you know where he could send letters without any connection with the Soviet embassy and and then I could write to him then I told him to what uh, how to sign the letter what word to use and what letter what word I'd use you know all the, all the I mean the real real espionage kind of work you know but anyway so I got him and eventually Eventually, the last uh, last day that I was meeting him, I mean, I drained him uh, with all this difficulty, like pulling teeth. I, I must have pulled 500 teeth out of him, you know. Uh, finally, I, we got everything. I mean, we had a solid, solid case. All his, he said, all along he was making more and more admissions every here and there, slipping more and more, admitting more and more and more, you know. And uh, finally, we had, we had a, a very, very strong case to arrest him, you know. And uh, so the last time I met with him, I knew it probably would be the last time. And then I, uh, I told him, uh, oh, by the way, you know, do you need any passport uh, in case somebody comes after you and uh, tries to do something so you can escape, you know? You know, spies usually get a passport and all, a means of escape, you know, mm -hmm. some cash, some, a passport and all that. Uh, he said, no, I don't need it. He said, I said, you're not worried about it? He said, no. He went like that. He said, you know, statute of limitations ran out a long time ago because over 30 years. And so he's, he's thinking it's free and clear, you know, the rest of his life. Now, uh, previously before that, uh, he, several years before that, uh, he had two habits. He loved playing the horses and he was very good at it. So he used to go to two, one in Baltimore, somewhere and somewhere else, to two uh, racetracks, mm -hmm. like at least once a week and play horses, you know. And I think he used to even write a little column about that. And another thing he used to do, uh, he, he uh, did, did some uh, work in coins, buying and selling coins, you know, silver coins, gold coins, and all that, you know. So he did some of that work and r the, the horses. But also his wife, his second wife, and he got two kids from her, she worked in a postal office. She was a, a clerical employee in the postal office in that area. Well. He had a routine. He'd go, leave home. I mean, she'd go to work, kids would go to school. He'd leave home, go to a place where he'd get a hamburger or a cheeseburger or sometimes two cheeseburgers. You know. I mean, he had, he had a voracious appetite. And like I said before, eating the wrong things most of the time. No, no carrots and celery. You know. I mean, he ate the, wrong, the real thing, you know, with a lot of cheese. And go, yeah. anyway. So he'd had that. And then he'll go to the racetrack and then come back and go home. And then, so, so... When he was in one of those, in, in that place where he used to eat, it, it was, there was a bar and a restaurant and uh, like pool tables and stuff. It, it's a big joint. One time he was sitting there and they had a pool table against the wall. And for some reason it fell and it fell on his back and it crushed several of his vertebrae. They crushed the vertebrae, you know. And of course he went to the hospital and all that. And at that time they did a procedure on him or an operation uh, that has been done only once, I think, before. And what they did was, since his spinal column was shattered in some of the vertebrae, they could not fuse them. They couldn't do mm. anything about them. So what they did in that case, they removed two of his ribs. They cut the side, they removed two ribs. Then they split the rib in two, and they fused them to his spine, you know, to, keep, to give him support. Otherwise, he cannot stay upright, you know. They fused it to his back and it worked, you know. Wow. Yeah, it, it was successful, you know. And like I said, it was second time, second or third time done in this whole nation. You know? Anyway, so they fused it, it. Then he, of course, he sued the joint for that accident and he got half a million dollars in cash as a settlement. So he, he was sitting, you know, happy. Mm -hmm. If he has half a million bucks, he has a little job uh, do, or business doing selling and buying coins and doing the, winning money on the track and his wife is working, so it's fine. So when he told me that, uh, you know, statute of limitations ran out, you know, they can't do anything. So he figured he's set for life, you know. So I told him, oh, I don't think so. He looked at me, he said, what do you mean? I said, I don't know much about the American law, but as far as I know, I understand that there is for espionage there is no statute of limitations. He said, well, 10, 15 years, you know. 
I said, well, I don't know. I said to him, why don't you talk to, if you have a, a friend who's a lawyer, why don't you talk to him about it? Or go to a library and check a law book and to see if this, uh, this is so, you know, because I understand there is no statute. And you could see him, you could feel the pucker factor, you know, because he, all do you, of a sudden. Do you, you know what pucker factor is? I do not. No. Uh, explain it to him. Uh, your, your backside? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. It's really Say no the, more. The sphincter no. muscle closes <laughs> very quickly and very sharply and very audibly. <laughs> anyway. So were you like helping him by giving him this warning? No, no. Well, yeah, sort, sort of, you know. But of course, like I said, this was my last meeting, so I didn't care what happens after that. Mm -hmm. We had them. We had them already. Uh, I had them by, you know what, you know. And of course, you know what, and I'm sure. I hope you know what. But anyway. <laughs> But legally, we had them, you know. Anyway, so so I, I could say that because if I had said it earlier and he gets nervous and afraid, he might not see him again. But now we had everything. There's nothing else to get from him. Yeah. I even got more than we thought we'd get, you know. So I did such a fantastically good job. <laughs> I mean, fant really fantastically great, great. <laughs> no, and now I'm blowing my own horn, right? <laughs> but in all, all seriousness aside, I did a fantastically good job. Uh, first of all, to res resurrect the case from that was from 30 years ago, mm -hmm. and then to have him make all these admissions that are enough for us to arrest him and prosecute him, you know, successfully. And so he said, so you could hear that uh, he, he got nervous. And I said, check it out. I, I'm not sure. I'm not a lawyer, but a, a friend of mine at the embassy who stud is a lawyer and he studied American law also. And I understand that he said that there is no statute of limitations on espionage, you know, which is true, you know. I think what murder also, I think. Mm -hmm. something, but anyway, so so you could see that, but it was too late. <laughs> I, I squeezed him, you know, dry. You know. Uh, the only thing is, I, I'm a nice gentleman. I didn't throw him away. I squeezed him, but didn't throw him away, you know. Anyway, mm -hmm. so, and we said goodbye, goodbye, and all that. That was the end of it. Uh, and of course, I was right. and. Statue of limitations has not run out, and we, we nailed them. And, uh, and we, we took him to court, of course, he, we had a trial, and, uh, and he wanted to go to trial. You know? I mean, we had a solid case uh, on him. And of course, he got a defense lawyer. Of course, he, had, he could afford it because he had half a million bucks and all that other money. Uh, so he had a lawyer, and the lawyer, I guess, looked at the data and said, probably said, hey, listen, buddy, they got you. Uh, plead guilty and, and see what what lighter sentence you might get. The guy didn't like it, so he fired his lawyer. So then he got another lawyer. And same thing, it didn't work out again. He didn't like the lawyer, so he fired him. He got a third lawyer, you know. In the meantime, he's sitting in prison, you know. And, and you know, he's, so finally the judge called him, the judge who's uh, going to oversee the case, called him and called the U.S. attorney, assistant U.S. attorney, and the FBI case agent, not me, I was in, had to go, called them all in, and, and Lipka. And he told them, listen, uh, because by law, they cannot keep the guy in prison so long without starting a trial or let him go or something, you know. But this guy was like 18 months in prison. And, uh, but then the judge told everybody, said, he wanted on the record that this is your choice to Lipka, not going to trial. So the reason why you're so long in, in prison is your choice, mm -hmm. yeah, not the government, you know. And uh, so he made everybody understand that, of course, we'll realize that. And he wanted it entered into uh, record because later on the defense attorney would come say, wait a minute, Your Honor, uh, the guys, the government kept him for 18 months. Uh, that, that, that's against the law, you know. No, he wanted it. So that went, uh, and finally, but Dirk still wanted to go to trial. So, of course, I would have been the, the star witness in the, in the case. And what I did was, whenever I uh, testified in federal court, I always wore a disguise. Because, you know, sometimes you have photographers. If not photographers, they have sketch artists and all that. So I, one thing I wanted to protect my face, my looks, my physiognomy, you know. Mm -hmm. so because if my picture came out in the newspaper or on TV or somewhere, and next time I guess, go against a guy who's a spy, I'll say I'm Soviet diplomat. He says, wait a minute, I saw your picture, you're an FBI agent. I saw yeah. it. See, so I had to protect my identity very, very carefully. Uh, all the time, the, the bureau, and even after I retired, I protected my 
facial identity, you know. Never came out anywhere. My name came out, you know, the cases, you know, but not never my face. So anyway, so I was getting ready to go to trial. And uh, I had to go, of course, to Pennsylvania. I, I got, I was the first one to testify. So I went in, I put on my disguise and all that. And uh, I was walking already to the courtroom because I was going to be the first one to testify. And the assistant U.S. attorney came out and said, to meet you, hold it. He just decided to plead guilty. After all that time? After all that time. Wow. After 18 years in prison, he decided to plead guilty. So you, know? you didn't have to testify? So I didn't have to testify. With, you know, we didn't have to have trial. He pleaded guilty, and I didn't have to testify and to present all the case. And, uh, of course, I was relieved. You know. Did any of you ever, did you ever testify in court? Never. No, you, Never. did you? Yeah. Uh, I don't know, Al, you probably testified in court. It's, it's not an easy thing. It's not a pleasant thing. Of course, I'm on the side of the law. So it's, it's uh, but still the, the defense can try to trick me and come up with some things, you know. Mm. But I was glad, so I didn't have to. So I went and washed my face, took off my wig and everything else. And, and he pleaded guilty and he got, I forget what, 20 years or something like that. And finally, they, for good behavior. But anyway, uh, uh, when he came out, he tr uh, trimmed down a lot because he was not eating all those cheeseburgers and all that, you know. He trimmed down a lot and all, came out of the prison and a few years later he died, you know, so anyway, but, but that's my most difficult case that I ever did, you know, it was very, very difficult. 